Each one of us dream. We dream sometimes of a better future, of a better tomorrow, occasionally for a roof over our heads, for a better future for our children, for a childhood that some of them sometimes don't attain due to inequity that we have in our country. And it's imperative that these dreams get translated through expression and through speech into wonderful moments that we can all treasure. It is the arts, finally, that can make all of this possible. It is imperative that we dream our dreams and we give them words and we allow them to take flight into the air because it's through the arts and through these thoughts that we look into other cultures. The arts provides us a window of opportunity to open our minds and to travel distances and look into the souls and thoughts and philosophies of a people we don't necessarily know. Three years ago, I remember when MJ Akbar first called me and said, you must meet Samba. I had a dream. I had a dream of going to the Northeast, an area that one had always dreamt of, one had always heard of, but never had the occasion to travel to. And really, thank you very much for bullying me to come here uh, kicking and screaming Samba. I know I've given you some heart attacks of, of, of having to cancel in between. But truly, it is through this notion of being able to look into another person's mind that we're able to understand what happens uh, in another space. In today's extremely divisive world, full of violence, full of inequity, it is very important for each one of us, and especially those who, in, who can influence, to be able to understand what the other needs, what the other wants, what the other expresses. And again, as I said, culture is extremely important for that. For too long have governments looked at culture as a handout. For too long have artists looked to governments for handouts. It is time that each of us, writers, dancers, performers, dreamers, thinkers, philosophizers, each of us realize the incredible value and wealth that the arts create. It creates not just intangible wealth, it creates tangible wealth. It creates economic wealth. At the Edinburgh Festival, which is a five-week-long festival that happens each year, a celebration of the arts, last year, 275 million pounds of additional spend came into the city of Edinburgh. In West End, 7.3 million pounds, uh, sorry, billion pounds of additional spend flows into London's economy due to the arts and entertainment district. And in America, New York's West End, that's $11.7 billion. At the Jaipur Literature Festival, which is one of the 23 festivals that we produce across the world, last year, uh, or rather this year in January, we calculated that the, re the city received an additional 16 to 20 crores of additional spend to the 250,000 people who came in for the festival across five days. Festivals are economic propositions. The arts, too, are economic propositions. What we need governments to do is to create infrastructure. What we need governments to do is understand that by doing festivals like this, of creating opportunities for artists and musicians and thinkers to be able to perform and produce and write with the freedom of expression. They're able to create an incredible tomorrow. Across the world today, there is an accent about out-of-the-box thinking. Every corporate looks for a way to make this possible as to how to get their managers to think out of the box. Well, the arts does that anyway. So why don't we ever treasure it? Why don't we ever realize its wealth and value? 25 years ago, I set up a small trust called the Salam Balak Trust. This was for street children 
who ran away from home from different parts of the world, from different parts of India, and came to Delhi. And our chief focus in trying to rehabilitate these kids was to provide the arts as a primary platform through workshops, uh, through occasions, through performances. They were able to understand, they were able to gain confidence, and we were able to rehabilitate them and make them part of the mainstream world. Today, we have engineers. In fact, one of our kids last week was the first um, graduate and got an aeronautical engineering degree uh, from a university in Chennai and has got his first job. We have many children who've got scholarships to the Americas, to Australia, and across India. And primarily, it's the arts that's created the foundation for that. So it does create an incredible opportunity. Three years ago, because of my long hair, I often get invited to give uh, keynote addresses, and I often get invited to go as advisors to different governments. I used to advise the government, the Arts Council of England, and they had a big riot in London. And I said to them on one occasion, I said, why don't you match the places where there was rioting to the places where you've closed down arts and community centers due to budget cuts. It was only a notional thought. I had no idea as to what the outcome would be. But when the outcome arrived, when the survey happened, I mean, sometimes they take long-haired people seriously, so when the survey did happen and it arrived, it matched perfectly. And I said to them, I said, what do you expect when you shut down an arts or a community center? Where do young people go? The arts creates a pressure valve on a pressure cooker. This is so required in a country as divisive and large and diverse as India. If you don't give them that opportunity, we will implode. It is through the arts that you can express yourself and do it peacefully and you can make a point. You can put across your point of view. How important is that? Why do governments feel it's so important sometimes to shut down the processes of communication, to shut down and say that, no, this is not allowed, or freedom of speech should not be allowed, or freedom of expression should not be allowed. And this is not just in India. We've seen this across the world in many of the countries that we work in, whether it's Israel or Egypt or South Africa or indeed the United States of America. And again and again we try and fight and we put this argument across that it is imperative that in this new age of communication, freedom of expression and the freedom to express yourself is the most vital, inalienable human right today. Without that, we are no better than robots. We are no better than the animal on the street. In India, we have been given an incredible constitution by our founding fathers. They have left us a legacy that we must be proud of. But they have also left us a legacy which we must fight for, which we must fight for each day. We cannot take our constitution for granted. We cannot take our rights for granted. We cannot take our freedoms for granted. And with every freedom, there is a duty, there is a responsibility for each one of us as a citizen, young or old, whether it's to follow the law or to give back to society. If each one of us was to give back to society, we would be a far more equitable society than we are today. India is not a poor country. We are a very rich country. And we must give back to each and every person who needs our help and effort. I know in the Northeast, there have been many, many struggles and many, many problems. And when you all go out into the world, you face these. I know in Delhi, for example, there's a whole um, area of concern as to how people view people from the Northeast. But I say to each one of you, what have you done to be able to assimilate? How have you taken your culture out? 
Yes, occasionally we see tired festivals on the lawns of the Ashoka Hotel where a few people come to see some of your offerings. You have an incredible heritage. Your costumes that I've seen today, your art, your basket weaving, your dances, your traditions, your thinking, your poetry, your literature. All of this must go out. All of this must identify you as a people. As we migrate, and this is the age of migration, and each of us travel from one city to the other in search of a better dream, what roots us? Tradition and culture and our stories and our dreams and what we've inherited from our parents and their grandparents and their forefathers. And that's something we must treasure. Each of you in the arts here must go out there and explore, do workshops, look for collaborations. It's not easy. The arts is a lifestyle choice. If you want to become rich, go become a banker or go and learn an MBA. But if you want to be in the arts, if you're passionate about it, if that's what you eat, learn, breathe, talk, think, it is possible. Today, my very own company, Teamwork, we produce 23 festivals in 11 countries, and we are not a not-for-profit company. We are a for-profit company, and we have created wealth. The Harvard Business School teaches a case study on what we've done, not just in India, but across the world. So it is possible. Dream your dream and go out. In tomorrow's world, remember, we are entering a completely new phase, a phase which is democratic, which allows us access to information through the internet, through our phones. And I'm sure that what will happen in the future is that we won't be looking for that next one big idea, but there will be a million new ideas that will rise into the night like fireflies and illuminate us all because each one of us has that idea, has a dream, has an expression, and we can convey it through the many vehicles that we have today. It is this celebration that I'd really like to thank the Department of Culture and Tourism here in Meghalaya and Samba for making this possible. It is very important. And over the next few years, as you continue to bring in people from across the country and across the world to your state here and your city, you will see that it will pay benefits, it will pay dividends. So hang on to your dream, Samba, spread it to every young person here in this room or every young person who wishes to achieve something and every artist who's aching to express themselves. Don't take no for an answer and go out and do your thing because that's what we've taken birth in this country for, to dream our dream. Thank you.